I want to thank you for joining me for this week's Bible study, where in our Bible study this week, we're going to continue on the journey to the cross, where we have been taking a look at pivotal moments in scripture that lead to the cross, that leads to our need of Christ, our need for Christ to, to die for us, to become our propitiation. In our study last week, we took a look at, we took a look at God creating mankind. We took a look at the reason, the purpose as to why it was that God created mankind for all of you who may have not watched that study, let's answer that question once again. Why was it? Why did God create mankind? What was his purpose? What was his reason for creating us? The Lord desires for us to be fruitful, for us to multiply. And so he created this world, a paradise for man to live in, to where Adam and Eve, when they lived in the garden, they had need for nothing. The Lord he would dwell with them. He was there with them in the garden, living in fellowship with, with Adam and Eve. God, his desire was to dwell with mankind, to dwell for all of eternity, for everlasting life with mankind. But again, we saw in a pivotal moment in scripture last week where God gave instructions to Adam and Eve and the choice was laid out. Obey the instructions or disobey the instructions. And we know how the story played out. We know that they disobeyed. We know that they ate from the tree, which God instructed them not to eat from. And we know that from that, sin was born in the world. And here in our study this week, I don't want to focus too much on sin. I want to take a look at bright lights that began to shine in the world due to two individuals, two people who we're going to be taking a look at in our study this week, due to them actually listening and then doing. They obeyed the Lord. We are going to start off our study this week by taking a look at Noah, and then we are going to move over to looking at Abraham here in our study for this week. I want to start us off there in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis to where we are going to look at scripture that will run from the first verse down to the ninth verse. That's again, we're going to start off here today in the sixth chapter of Genesis we're going to start at the first verse and we're going to work we're going to work our way down through the ninth verse. And so as I said, after Adam and Eve, after they were kicked out of the garden, uh, we know that sin again it, it spread throughout the world. Uh, we saw it with with Cain and with Abel, Abel where Cain he murdered his brother out of spite, a sinful action, right? And so over time as we see there in the first verse we're told there in the first verse of the sixth chapter that it came to pass. That means over time, time passed by. We're told when man, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. We'll see there in the second verse, it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And so what we see there in the first and the second verse is that man, in a manner of speaking, was doing what the Lord desired. They were certainly multiplying. We see that. But were they being fruitful? Was man being fruitful and multiplying? In order for us to be fruitful today, what must we do? In order for you to be fruitful, what do you think that you need to do? The answer to that question is that you need to heed the word of God. And, and what I mean by heeding the word of God is, is that you're not simply supposed to, to listen to the word or hear the word of God and then do nothing. It's, it shouldn't go in one ear and out the other ear. You hear me say that often, right? We must heed the word of God. We must be attentive to the word of God. We, we must pay attention to it. Listen to the word of God and then move accordingly. That is something that I just preached about in a, in a recent sermon about being obedient how do we be obedient? How, how do we go about being obedient to the Lord? We hear and we do. We are attentive. We listen and we do accordingly. We, we follow his instructions. That is how you obey. Did they obey? We'll see in the day of Noah there, in the third verse, where the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years, is what we see there 
in the third verse. So when we see that, when we, when we see the, the Lord say there that a spirit shall not strive with, with, with men, he's talking about abiding with. The Lord said that he could not abide with man forever. Why could God not abide with man forever? That's something that, again, we covered in our in our study last week, where we took a look at that pivotal moment in, in the Bible with Adam and Eve. And that's something that I mentioned in the opening of this study. God will not dwell with sin, which Adam and Eve, they became when they disobeyed the Lord. Because of Adam and Eve, sin is spread through the world. It became part of our nature. And again, like I said in, in last week's study, you know, we, we may have a desire to, to live holy, to live righteously. You know, that's we hunger for it as a child of God. We, we hunger, we thirst for righteousness. But unfortunately, like Paul said, within us, there is a contrary nature. We... we we may have a law of God that is present within us because we, we do our best to abide by his word. But at the same time, that old man is still present within all believers. And so we have these two contrary parts that, that battle back and forth within us. Now, what about those who, who don't abide by the word of God, those who do not heed the word of God? Well, only thing that is present with them is the law of sin, right? And sadly, unfortunately, that's what we see here in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. The Lord is saying, these people, they, they still have sin in their flesh. They are indeed sinful, he says there in that third verse. He says that he could not abide there. He could not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. He is sinful. It is at the root of who he is. The root of who we are is to disobey the Lord. And, and yes, that, that is a very sad statement to make. Even though we may desire to live holy and righteous at our core, at our root, is this, this nature of disobedience. That, that we as believers, we, we end up fighting against all the days of our life where we are trying, where we're doing our best to be holy and righteous. But that fight is not present in the hearts of those who are convicted of living in sin, those who desire to live according to their own will and not the will of God. So there in the third verse, what we see there is that even though the Lord kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. He still loved them. He still loved mankind, even after they had passed away. When we get here to the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, we see where even though man was sinful, we see where God was still trying to reach out to mankind to, to get them to turn away from sin because of his plan, because of his desire. What is his plan? What is his desire? God's desire is to dwell with us, to dwell with mankind. But he cannot dwell with us. He cannot dwell with mankind because of the nature of sin being present in us. God will never abide with sin. And as I said in last week's study, he raises a barrier. Sin, it separates us from the Lord. That is the only thing that can block you from the Lord, sin. Only because God will not abide with sin. He, he, he will not abide in the presence of sin. He will cast sin away from his presence for all of eternity. That is what we know. And so we'll see here again where God said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. If we skip down to the fifth verse, we'll see even more where the Lord, again, speaking about his relationship with mankind, if you will. Like I said in last week's study, after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, after they disobeyed, the relationship that was, that was once of harmony, it went sour. It went bitter. There was a wall that was raised because of, of Adam and Eve's disobedience. And so, again, like I said, that disobedience, sin, 
the only thing that it did was, was continue to grow from that point in time. And so when we take a look at the fifth verse, the fifth verse we'll see there that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. It multiplied, it grew. And then the scripture says that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Again, look at, look at that verse there. Okay. Again, that verse, it says that the intent of the thoughts of his heart, the root coming from his soul, what came out of his soul was again, a desire to disobey. The Lord said that it was a desire. It was only evil, not even good. Man lacked. Man lacked in, in doing anything that was good in the eyes of God in that day. And so that says, that says a lot about the day of Noah, the day in which Noah lived in. And then again, there in the sixth verse, look at, look at the Lord's thoughts towards man, his feelings that we see here in, in this sixth verse. Well, we'll see there, it says, and the Lord was sorry. The Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord was hurting here. And this is, it is truly sad because once again, we know what the Lord's desire was in creating man. That's why we had the study last week. We know what his desire was. His desire was for, for man to be in his image and in his likeness. But man had the propensity to, to just continue to disobey, to be sinful, where the Lord, again, he is love and he is faithful. Man was supposed to be fruitful and multiply. Was man being fruitful? They were certainly multiplying. They were spreading throughout the world. But what was it that was spreading in the world? The Lord desired for man to live in his abundance. That is to live in God's abundance. Okay. And man was supposed to live in that abundance in peace and in love. Moving, caring about the love of God. The love that they were created with. That we were created with. But again, Man could not stop from disobeying. Man could not stop from living wickedly. Man could not stop living out of, out of the evil intent that was in, in their hearts. And so it wasn't love that was spreading in the world. Guess what was spreading in the world? Sin. And so again, we'll see there in that sixth verse that the Lord was sorry. God was sorry that he made man. All right. On the earth. The earth was created to be a paradise. The Lord seeded the earth. He, he, he furnished the earth with all that man needed to where man in the garden didn't have to want for anything. And then we see what, what sin, what sin did. Sin has corrupted the world. We'll see there. To the point that, that the Lord was grieved in his heart. And then there in the seventh verse, the scripture says that the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. This is leading up to a pivotal moment here. Another pivotal moment that we have here in scripture to where, again, we see that God, he he does not tolerate sin. See, a lot of people today, they, again, misunderstand the Lord and they think that, that God is tolerant of sin. Yes, God is, is merciful, but that doesn't mean that he is tolerant of our sins. That doesn't mean that he tolerates us disobeying him. God is not pleased. He's not happy when we disobey him, when we live in disobedience. The Lord there is a reason and purpose that he rebukes us. And the reason why he rebukes us, the reason why he has offered us a, a correction is for us to guess what? Correct ourselves. He doesn't want you to live in sin. So don't think for a second, don't think for a moment that the Lord is tolerant of, of your disobedience. God is not tolerant of your disobedience. So the Lord, he was set 
He desired to destroy man from the first, the face of the earth. And why did he desire to destroy man from the face of the earth? Because of man's sin, because of man's disobedience, the Lord was ready to judge. And the judgment of, of mankind, it was not one that was in, in our favor. Now, when we take a look there at the eighth verse, we'll see there that that at least one, at least one was a somewhat spark, a somewhat light in this dark world. So we'll see there in the eighth verse that the scripture says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What was it about Noah, right? Because again, we, we see there from, from all that we read from the first through the eighth verse that the world was a wicked place. It seemed that all man knew was how to be evil. Yet, again, there in a verse, we're told that, that Noah found grace with God. What was it so special that was about Noah? Why, why did Noah find grace? Why did nobody else, why was nobody able to find grace in the eyes of the Lord? You know, Noah, he seems to be favored by God, right? And so what was it that was special about him? Well, again, we're told that in that ninth verse that Noah, he was a just man, Okay. Then we're told that he was perfect in his generations. So what was it that made him just, right? What was it about him that made him perfect? Was, was Noah, was he without flaws? Was, was he without blemishes? No, not necessarily, right? Because as Paul said, all have sinned and, and fall short of the glory of God. No one is perfect, but the scripture says that he was perfect in his generations, I mean, if you think about it, you know, just looking at looking at what we've seen so far in Scripture, everyone was living evil, you know. So why was he considered to be perfect in his generations? What was it about him that made him just? Well, look at the rest of what is said there in the ninth verse. We're told there that Noah walked with God. This is very important. All right. This is very important for us to note there. The fact that Noah walked with God, that is why he was considered a just man. That is why he was considered perfect in his generations. He walked with the Lord. Out of all of those that was living at that time, all right, where again we 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 see where man had no problem multiplying. But they were they they were evil. The intent of their heart was to do nothing but evil continually, is what scripture said. But here we have Noah, to where Noah was one who walked with the Lord. So Noah, he was essentially living in fellowship with the Lord. What does it mean? What do you think it means to, to be in fellowship with God? How does one go about being in fellowship with the Lord? I think many of us, we would first say, well, in order for us to enter into fellowship with the Lord, we, we must have faith. We must believe in him. That certainly is the right starting place to, to be in fellowship with the Lord. But one must also, again, be obedient. We, we cannot forget that part. Obedience is the key. I, I can't stress that enough. You see, a lot of people, and you've heard me say this recently before in my sermons, I seemingly have been getting on this a lot lately, a lot of people have no problem with hearing the Word of God. They will show up to church, they will show up to church every Sunday, they will show up for the Bible studies, they have no problem opening up their Bible, right? They have no problem reading their Bible. And, and as I've said before, there is nothing wrong with, with going to church there's nothing wrong with going to Bible study. In fact, I would encourage it. There is nothing wrong with, with opening up your Bible. Again, I would encourage reading the scripture. But what you must do and what the word of God demands is a response and action. The word of God was not simply given to us to be ignored. Yes, it is good to pick up the Bible, read the Bible to, to gain knowledge, to gain wisdom, right? It is good for you to be able to quote scripture. It's good. 
but are you living by it? It's good for you to show up to church every Sunday for the sermons, for the, the songs, right? It's good for you to show up to Bible study. I appreciate all of you who, who stop and may watch a few minutes of a sermon or a Sunday school lesson or a Bible study or, or the food for thoughts that I share. I appreciate it. But my hope is that the message that I share, whether it is through the Sunday school lessons, the Bible studies, or the sermons, or the food for thoughts, the, the short clips that I share, my hope is that that word, that it sits in your heart. In other words, that it abide with you, that it dwells in you. You see, it does us no good if we pick up the Bible, we read the Bible, but the word doesn't sit in us. It does us no good if we go to church every Sunday, if we go to church every Wednesday for Bible study, but the word doesn't sit in in us. You see, again, we must be obedient. We must not only hear the word of God, we must be attentive to the word of God. And then again, we must move accordingly. We must live by the word of God. That is what the word of God demands from us. Noah, he lived in fellowship with the Lord because he obeyed God. We are able to live in fellowship with the Lord when we not only hear him, when we not only believe in him, but when we are attentive to his instructions and when we follow his instructions, when we are obedient to his instructions, that is when we know that we are in fellowship with the Lord. So Noah was special for that purpose, that reason. He obeyed God in a day where the intent of man's heart was to do evil continually. Now, let's take a look. I want to take a look at the pivotal moment that we'll see begin or we'll see really kick in here, starting there in the 11th verse. Let's read from the 11th verse through the 14th verse there. We'll see there in the 11th verse, the scripture, it says, the earth was also corrupt. All right. The earth also, the earth also was corrupt because of sin. Again, sin, it, it was corrupting. Uh, not just mankind, but it was corrupting the world as well. Like my dad used to say all the time, when Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed in the garden, the 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 apes, the the hair on on the gorilla's back began to gray. Uh, my dad would go; he would just go through a whole phrase of of how things began to to die off after after man disobeyed in the garden. But again, we're told there in eleven verse says the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. This, again, is on man's behalf. Man was evil. Man was corrupt. Man was violent. And, and it was, you know, Cain, when he, when he, when he killed his brother in, in, uh, in his day, when he killed Abel in his day, the Lord, when he came to him, he said, your brother's blood, it screams, it screams from, from the earth here. So, again, the earth was the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So the verse says, so God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Then we get down to the 13th verse, where, where the pivotal moment where it begins, where it really kicks in there. We see that God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold... The Lord said, I will destroy them with the earth. It says there in the 14th verse, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. The Lord instructs there. And then we'll see throughout the rest of that verse where, where the Lord gives him the instructions on, on how the ark was supposed to be constructed. So here we are in another key pivotal moment here that I again want to point out to you if you didn't catch it, it revolves around instructions from the Lord once again, where in our study last week, we saw where Adam and Eve, they were given instructions by the Lord. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree that was in the midst of the garden. They weren't supposed to eat from it. They had a choice, obey or disobey, right? Noah has a choice here, all right? Again, the Lord, he instructs them, or he first, God first tells them there, I'm going to destroy them with the earth. He says, make yourself an ark. All right. And so it's a command, but Noah, 
He's he has free will. We were we are created with free will. Again, obey or disobey. That's the choice that that Noah was given in this very pivotal moment. You know, you could go down the the what if road. What if Noah didn't obey? He would have been destroyed. Mankind would have been lost, right? But mankind wasn't lost, right? We we are present today. And we know that Noah did construct the ark. We know that there was a great flood, again, according to scripture, what we read there, and I believe it. All right. So again, we, we see where God, he was judging, he was judging mankind here. He judged mankind, he judged the world. He did it with the great flood, where we see that he's judging the sin of, of the world. He's judging sin from mankind. And so again, like I said, it's a very pivotal moment because we we see how, again, the Lord, his thoughts toward sin. And the Lord, he does not love sin. He does not love disobedience. He's not tolerant of it. There is a line that you can cross with the Lord, and you should not want to cross that line. Because if you cross that line, you set yourself to be an enemy of the Lord. You set yourself to be his adversary. And God, he crushes his enemy. The Lord destroys his adversaries. He's going to cast them away from his presence for eternity. We have gone over that quite a bit this season in our studies. All right, so we, we, have, we have seen where God gave Noah instructions, right? And we, saw, we, we know that Noah followed the instructions. I want us to turn over to the eighth chapter here. And I want us to take a look at scripture that runs from the 20th through the 22nd verse here. Because this, this again, is another pivotal key moment that we see here in, in scripture. Well, we see that in the 20th verse, the scripture says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So the great flood, it has ended, it has ceased. Noah and his family, they, they are back on dry ground. And we see this, this burnt offering, which is a sign of being committed to the Lord. Noah was saying, I am committed to you. So this again shows Noah's faith. It shows that he was in a fellowship with the Lord, that he and the Lord, that they were living in harmony. All right. Very important. And so we'll see there in the 21st verse that the Lord, he smelled a soothing aroma. And then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done, he says there. And then again, there in the 22nd verse, the scripture says, while the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, it says there. Let me turn the page here and we'll see that the verse, it finishes off by saying winter and summer and day and night shall not cease. So again, this is a key moment that we see here in scripture. All right. And again, this, it, it points to the cross, whether you realize it or not. This is the covenant that the Lord made with Noah. This is also, I should point out, very key, very important for us to understand. This is a result of Noah's faithfulness, all right? This is a result of, of, of Noah listening to God and then moving accordingly. This is a result of Noah being obedient in his faith. Like I said, if you say that you are a child of God, or you, you must live in obedience. And I would ask, are you living in obedience? Because there are many who love to say that they are a child of God. They have no problem with hearing the word, but living by the word, moving according to the word, that's another story. Okay? And so again, we see where the, where, where the Lord was pleased with the, the offering, the burnt offering that, that Noah sent up. He was pleased with, with Noah's faithfulness, with Noah being committed to, to him. Is God pleased with you? Are you committed to the Lord today? I hope you are. 
because again, the Lord, he has made a covenant with us as well. And we're going to get into that. We're going to work our way to that. We're not going to cover that here, here in our study today, but we see the end result of faithfulness to where the Lord, he makes a covenant. But what I do want to point out here about the covenant that is made with Noah here is that it is not necessarily about mankind, right? Pay close attention to to what, what is said there in the covenant, all right? Let us again, let's let's again take a look at that, right? We'll see there again that the Lord he smelled the soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. God even points out here that the imagination of man's heart is evil. The Lord knew the nature that that resided in man. He knew that the nature of disobedience, he knew that it was still present in man. He knew that it was still there. Even though Noah was being obedient, he knew that the nature was still present in the hearts of man. So he knew that man would disobey again. God ain't no idiot. God is not dumb, right? But again, he said here, he said, I, again, I will not destroy every living thing as I have done. And that's, again, the sad part about the great flood, the sad part about what the sin of man, what it did. God destroyed every living thing because of of the sin of mankind. Nature suffered, the world suffered because of the sin of mankind. But God, again, he he makes a covenant here with Noah where he's saying, I'm not going to do that again. Nature of the world is not going to suffer because of man, because of the sin of man. He said there again, there in the 22nd verse, he said, while the earth remains, he said that the seed time harvest, he said, cold and heat, even seasons, day and night, he said, they will not cease, they will continue. So this covenant is about the life of the world is, is really about the world, nature itself. It's mostly a covenant with, with nature itself. I want to point out there that the Lord doesn't say anything about not ever judging man. He doesn't say anything about not ever destroying man. That's not said at all in that verse. All right. That is not what, what the, the covenant of Noah was about. All right. So with that in mind, I want us to journey over more here in Scripture today where we have covered a key moment there with Noah, I want to move us towards, towards another. Like I said, we're going to take a look here at, at Abraham. When we move over in Scripture, for example, I'm looking there at the 11th chapter of Genesis. We see where, where man was still moving about in sin. We see where, where man tried to construct to build a city, then build a tower on top of that city, the Tower of Babel they tried to build. And we'll see there where the Lord, he came down uh, to see the tower. We're told there in that fifth verse to see what was built. And then uh, we see where the Lord, he He stopped that from, from happening. He confused the languages, we're told there. And then man again scattered, we're told there uh, in Scripture. Now, something that we see here at the end there of the 11th chapter of Genesis We'll see there uh, in the 31st verse, we'll see a mention of Terah. All right. We'll see there in the 31st verse, it says, And Terah took his son Abram, we're told there, and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. All right. So we are now introduced to a man named Abram. We are told here this man will go on to be named Abraham. We'll get to that in Scripture. Now, I probably you'll probably hear me keep saying Abraham over and over and over again. But Abraham is Abram or was Abram. I should say Abram is Abraham. He became Abraham later on in his life. And like I said, we'll get to that in a moment. So we are introduced to Abram. We're introduced to Abraham who is going to serve as key to the next pivotal moment that we see here in Scripture today. Well, we'll see it began there in the 12th chapter of Genesis. We are going to take a look at that first verse. 
where the first verse we'll see there, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. So we again see God giving instruction to, to mankind, right? To, to one particular man uh, in Abram. And I think questions should arise from this. Similar to, to Noah, right? Why did God ask Noah? Why did why did the Lord speak to Noah? Why did Noah find grace in, in in the eyes of God? Why is it that the Lord? Why did He choose Abraham? Why did He choose Abram? Right? Why is He speaking to him? Why Why did He not speak to Terah? Right? It, it raises those questions. Something that we don't often speak about. Uh, is it is the history, the people that 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 Abraham came from. All right. Abraham, he came, he came from those who practiced idolatry. They were idolaters. Now you may be questioning me on how do you know that? Abraham, how do you know that he came from from idolaters, right? If we turn over to the 24th chapter of Joshua, If we turn over to the 24th chapter of Joshua and we take a look at the second verse in the 24th chapter of Joshua, we'll, we will see there where Joshua said to the people, he said to all the people, thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, people that we just saw mentioned in scripture. They dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods, is what the scripture says there in the 24th chapter of Joshua in the second verse. That's speaking about the people that, that Abraham, that he came from. They were idolaters. They worshiped other gods, right? So that is why we also see there in that scripture that the Lord instructs Abraham to, to get out of his father's house and to leave the land. Why was it that the Lord chose Abraham? Well, he desired to be in fellowship with him. And, and what we see here is that Abraham is listening to the Lord. He, he's, he's hearing these instructions from the Lord. And again, I, I believe that he shares that in common with Noah that in the day in which he lived in, in the house, that, the very house that he was living in at that point in time, people were not being obedient to the Lord. They were living in disobedience where Abraham was at least open to it. Now, did Abraham, did he pra practice idolatry? We don't know that. We know his father did. We know that he was in the house of idolaters, right? So we, we know that that was present. Now, we see here that Abraham is able to hear from the Lord. And so, again, we have another pivotal moment here to where Abraham has a choice here. You know, he's hearing from the Lord. He's never seen God. This is the first time we ever see in Scripture where it is mentioned that Abraham is hearing from, from the Lord. So was this the first time he heard from God? Was this the first time he ever heard from the Lord? I can't say for a fact, I know that it is recorded in scripture that it seems like this is the first time. So I will go off of that. And so I can assume here that Abraham is hearing a voice that he's never heard before, giving him instructions coming out of nowhere. And if I put myself in his shoes, I imagine that I'm looking around trying to see who it is that's speaking to me. I'm looking around. I'm trying to make sure that I'm not going crazy, right? And so Abraham, he is left, he was left with this choice. Do I obey? Do I do I follow the instructions from this voice that's coming out of nowhere? It, it just, I can hear it. Do I follow those instructions or do I ignore? Do I go my own way? A very pivotal moment that we see here in scripture on the journey to the cross. When we take a look at the second and the third verse. We'll see where we talk about uh, the covenant of the Lord, and we, we can start to see it there in the second and the third verse, where, where God essentially is giving promises to Abraham on of what he will do for Abraham if 
Abraham obeys, if if Abraham listens to and then move accordingly, if he follows the instructions, these you could say are incentives, right? So we'll see there in the second verse where the Lord said to Abraham, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you, right? He says, and make your name great and you shall be a blessing, what we see there. And then there in the third verse, the Lord said to Abraham, promising Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Again, these are promises that, that the Lord is making to Abraham. I want to note, yes, this is part of the covenant, but this is not the covenant confirmed to Abraham. Abraham has yet to move, at least what we see there from the first through the third verse. He hasn't done anything. He's just hearing from God, possibly and most likely for the first time, to where, again, you could think about it this way, to where God is saying, hey, I want you to go here, and if you go here, I make these promises to you. You will get this. That's essentially what we see here in this pivotal moment. And again, it's pivotal solely because of the choice that Abraham uh, has the opportunity to make here. Obey or disobey. Obey or disregard. Obey or ignore. It's, again, very similar to the choice of Noah, the choice of Adam, even the choice that, that we have to make today. Will I, obey, will I obey God or not? Will I obey? Will I disregard? Will I obey or will I ignore? That is the same choice that, that we all have to make. All people have to make that choice. So does Abraham, did he obey or disobey? Again, for all of you who may be hearing this for the first time, let's take a look at what was said there in the fourth verse. In the fourth verse, the scripture says, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. He obeyed. And what I like to point out about that fourth verse, and I believe I mentioned this in last week's study, is that we don't see any hesitation from, from Abraham. There's no delay. I mean, he could have he could have easily delayed, he could have easily hesitated. I, I believe I even said this before, and I think I said this in, in a Sunday school lesson in the fall quarter, to where, you know, I said this in, in a Bible study recently, to where we we took a look at when when Moses and the children of Israel, when they reached the point in the wilderness of Paran, when they were in Kadesh, to where they could have just entered into the promised land as God had commanded them. The people, they were fearful of the land, I said, you remember this? And they desired for Moses to send spies over into the land which the Lord permitted. Here we see Abraham, he had that same moment here to where he, he, at least for the children of Israel, they could see the promised land. Abraham doesn't even see the land. He was just instructed to move. And so we see the kind of heart that was in Abraham, right? He, he has the makings of one who would be faithful because he just gets up and he leaves. He, he goes, he he leaves from, from his father's house. We're told there in the fourth verse again, it said, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot, we're told there, went with him. And Abraham, or Abram, was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. The fifth verse says, Then Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran as well, we're told there. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram, we're told there in the sixth verse, passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the Tebaranif tree of Moreh, and the Canaanites were in the land. So Abraham, he was obedient, right? He, he listened to the Lord, and he moved accordingly. Now, I will point out, okay, I have to nitpick here a little bit because I did it with Noah as well. Abraham wasn't necessarily perfect in this moment. He wasn't necessarily flawless in this moment. Moment, His obedience, it wasn't complete in this moment. Do you catch the error that Abraham made there? 
from the fourth through the sixth verse, from the first through the sixth verse, anyway. Do you catch, do you see where he where he erred? Again, if you look at that first verse, Abram is told to get out of the country. He did that. He said, get away from your family and from your father's house. He got away from the father's house, but he didn't necessarily get away from the family. He brought Lot with him. And, and we're told that he brought the people that, that he, again, had acquired in Haran. He brought them with them. They were all of his father's house. He brought them with him. All right. Sarah, I, I you know, I'm not going to say anything that he did anything wrong with, with Sarah, his wife, because, again, you know, that's his wife. I don't think the Lord would have any problem with, with Aram bringing, you know, with him bringing his wife on, on this journey. She should have been with him. But he, he you know, he kind of had a missed up there with, with bringing a lot with him, with bringing those uh, who he had acquired, bringing them with them as well. You know, a slight missed up there. Again, no one is perfect. All right. We, we, we apply, I at least applied, applied Abraham for at least moving. All right. So we could say that he was striving by faith. And, and so that's, you know, that's a note that, that I want to share with all of you today as well here briefly is that I don't think myself perfect and, and I don't think anybody else perfect who, who does their best to live by the word of God. That's, the only thing that the Lord, what he most desires out of us when it comes to our faith is the effort. It is, I, I, I feel like we, we truly overlook that part of it. The Lord, he desires the effort of faith. He desires, he, he wants to see you at least put forth the effort. He wants to see you try to be faithful. And the sad thing about it is that so many of us, we, we get discouraged and, and we give up. We, we don't bother with faith. You know, we, we say it's too difficult. It's too hard for me uh, to, to live in obedience to the word of God. And so we just go back off and, and we sin. We, we just choose not to, to follow God's instructions. And so, yeah, like I said, even though he had the misstep here, I believe that the Lord, again, was merciful to him, just as God is merciful with us in our missteps. All right. And I do believe that the Lord forgave him, even though, again, there was this misstep that we see here in scripture. All right. So again, I want to do, I do want to point out there from, from the first verse again, all the way down there through uh, the, the ninth verse there that again, the covenant has yet to be confirmed. But what I do like about this, what I like about what the Lord did there from, from the fourth through the sixth verse is that the Lord, he showed Abraham the land. Because if we look at that ninth verse there, we'll see that Abraham, he journeyed going on still toward the south. That's what we're told there in the ninth verse there in the 12th chapter of Genesis. But if you're familiar with that map, that Old Testament map of, of the promised land, Shechem is in the north. All right, it's in the north, a very key location that, that we see in Scripture. And so Abraham, his home that he, that he lived in, it was a bit more further north than, than Shechem was. And so he was coming down. He was traveling down through the land. All right. And then if you happen to take a look there in the 10th verse, you'll see uh, that Abraham, he went down to Egypt is what we're told there in the 10th verse. And so again, if you're familiar with that map, you'll, you'll notice that, that Abraham, he traveled from the north to the south, moving in a southwesterly, uh, in, in a southwesterly type of direction to go over uh, into Egypt. Now, at this point, I want to skip over to the 13th chapter. I know I'm doing a lot of skipping here, but this is essentially where we're in the first verse. We're told there it says, Then Abraham, or then Abram, went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with them to the south. So they, the Lord had them travel from the north down southwardly towards Egypt. Then they, they got to Egypt. And again, there's some scripture that, that I overlooked there that you can actually take a look at what happened while they were in Egypt. But then they, they had a moment where they turned around and then they went back up to, to inherit uh, the land of Canaan. So the Lord showed him the land. All right. He, Abraham didn't need any spies. He was the spy, if you think about it, in, in what I referenced earlier. So he, 
he went through the land. He was able to see the land. He was able to see the people in the land as well. And then again, he got to Egypt and he turned around and he went back up to inherit the land. Again, being obedient. Let's turn over one last stop. All right, I promise you this time, one last stop over to the 17th chapter. Because again, we were talking about the covenant. I, I want to point out where the covenant is confirmed for, for Abraham. Because again, we, we saw the pivotal moment and we see that Abraham was being obedient in this pivotal moment. He chose to obey God's instructions. And so the Lord had made promises to him. And so God is not one to, to not pay off his promises. All right. God is going to keep his promises. He may promise you something today and it might happen tomorrow. It may not happen tomorrow. It may happen years and years and years from now, but God is going to keep that promise. For Abraham, we see that it took a long time for it to happen. We're told that in the 17th chapter of Genesis, in the first verse, we're told that when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. We'll see there in the second verse, the scripture says, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And we're told there in the third verse, Abram, he fell on his face and that the Lord talked with him. This is where God, he confirms his covenant with Abraham. But again, I want you to notice there the, the age of Abraham. We're told there again in that first verse that he was 99 years old. All right. Now, I don't know if you remember this. I don't know if you paid attention to this. So we're going to turn back to the 12th chapter. All right. Turn back to that 12th chapter. And I want you to take a look at what's said there in that fourth verse. We're in the fourth verse. The scripture says that when Abraham, when he departed, as the Lord had spoken to him, the scripture tells us that he was 75 years old when he departed. All right. And, and, and I want you to understand that that this was happening at a time where the lifespan was about, you know, 120 years. All right. That's, that's what you see over uh, in sixth chapter of, of Genesis. Right. So he was old. I, scripture does not hide the fact that he was old. And again, when we take a look at the 17th chapter in that first verse, he was 99 years old when the Lord was confirming the covenant with him. So that's a 14 year span there. So, Abraham had to go 14 years without the Lord for on, you know, Abraham would look, or we, I should say, we would have looked at it and we were going, man, the Lord had promised me some 14 years ago and he still hasn't done it. That's what we would be saying. You know, we, we will pray to the Lord and we would get upset if our prayers hadn't been answered in the next hour, the next two hours or the next day. We'll throw our hands up in the air. We'll get mad. We'll get frustrated, frustrated with the Lord and then we'll give up on him. Abraham had to wait 14 years for, for, to Lord, for the Lord to confirm the covenant. All right. And then there, when we take a look at the, the 14th, the 15th verse there, well, we'll see for Sarah there. It says, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, it says there in the 16th verse, and it says, and also give you a son by her. Abraham, he had been just waiting and waiting because, again, the promise. And, you know, the premise was that, that his name would be great, that he would have people who would inherit the land, right? But Sarah could not have a child, or at least that's what they thought. They had gone for so long. And so those 14 years they were essentially filled with trial and tribulation for Abraham to where his faith was tested by the trials and the tribulations. And as James said in the first chapter of James, when you take a look at the second and the third verse, you know, the, the testing of our faith with those trials and tribulations, what they do is increase our patience. They increase our faith. And so during those 14 years, Abraham, he learned some things about himself. He learned some things about his faith, and he had to learn how to be obedient. Within that time span, 
we see where where Sarah, where she felt, I can't give you, I can't give you a child. And and so they they tried to force God's promise. They tried to force it uh into existence. Sarah offered her her handmaiden to to Abraham, Hagar, to to for Abraham to to be with her so that she could have his child, so that she could have his son who would be able to inherit his inheritance. And so a big soap opera, a big drama, uh, it, it, it came forth out of that. And so, like I said, out of that, Abraham, again, he wasn't perfect. He could have easily turned away Hagar. He could have easily said, no, no, we're not going to do that to his wife. But he didn't do that. So Abraham, he had to learn obedience. He had to learn how to trust in the Lord. He had to learn how to walk by faith within that time span, which he did, which is where, again, we see where the Lord, he comes in and he confirms the covenant with Abraham. He not only confirmed the covenant, but he reassured, he reassured the covenant with Abraham by saying that your wife is going to bear the son, the son of promise which was Isaac, okay? Now, within the the covenant of Abraham, if you take a look at that, you'll see more that is spoken of about Abraham himself, where there in the fifth verse, it said, the Lord said to Abraham, you shall no longer be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations, it said there uh, in that fifth verse. Uh, it says there in the sixth verse, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings shall come from you. It said there in the seventh verse, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant, the Lord said there. And then he said uh, there in the eighth verse, I give to you and your descendants uh, the land there in which you are in which you were once a stranger, the land that Abraham was dwelling in, that's the land of Canaan. So again, we see the confirmation of the promised land that is the land of Canaan. So a a lot of this covenant, if you're looking at it, you say, well, this seems to be more focused on Abraham. Uh, You know, you may begin to wonder, because like I said, this is a study where we're taking a look at a journey to the cross. You may begin to wonder, well, what's, what's pointing towards the cross? What is actually pointing towards Jesus here? Well, for that, let's go back over to the 12th chapter. Let's go back over to that 12th chapter. And we'll see it there in the third verse. We're in the third verse. The scripture, it reads and it says there, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curse you. And then highlight this, underline this in your Bible, circle this in your Bible, if you will. He says, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be, what? Shall be blessed. So again, like I said, key moment, pivotal moment that we see here in scripture to where we we saw where the Lord made a covenant with Noah, but that was more so a covenant about not destroying the world, right? Because of the sin of mankind. But again, Noah's covenant, the covenant that was made with Noah, it could point to the cross because God, he didn't say that he wasn't going to judge man. He didn't say that he was not going to destroy man. Okay, he didn't say that he was not going to destroy the sinner in that covenant. And so when we look at the covenant that was made with with Abraham, we see where the judgment of man is, is in mind here as well. But again, all people, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What does that mean? The only way that all families of this world is blessed, the only way that we could be blessed is through the Lord, through the giving of God. And the giving of God that blesses all people is the giving of life. And I want you to understand, when I say that, I'm not talking about life in this world. I'm not talking about life as we know it physically in this world. I'm talking about spiritual life. I'm talking about everlasting life. And the only way that you and I can have everlasting life, that is with the Lord, 
is through the only begotten son that was given by the Lord. So the Abrahamic covenant, yes, it is a covenant about Abraham and his descendants, right? But it also is a covenant that covers all families of the world. And it is a covenant that points to Jesus, who was manifested in this world as the light of the world to reveal to mankind the truth. That again, all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God, that we need to repent from our sin and that we need to turn to Christ and that we need to live in obedience to his way. Then Jesus, he became our propitiation, that is our atonement offering, so that all of us can have that opportunity at everlasting life in the kingdom of the Lord. So again, we should be thankful today that Abraham made the choice to obey the Lord's instructions. We should be grateful that Abraham made the choice to live in obedience to the instructions of the Lord. So like I said, I hope that you enjoyed this study because we saw where, where our sins, where, where the sin in the garden, it set mankind back. It didn't set the Lord back, it set mankind back. But here in our study this week, we see where, yes, the Lord will judge sin. No doubt about it. God is going to judge sin. But we see that there is a way out of that judgment. And the way out of that judgment, it has been promised and it has been sealed by the Lord, who said through Abraham, through, through the seed of Abraham, right, all families of the world will be blessed. All right. So that is our study for this week. And again, like I said, I hope that you enjoyed this study. I hope that you enjoyed the study last week. I hope that you've enjoyed all of the studies that we have done this season. We only have a few more studies left uh, within this season. The next study that we're going to do, we're going to again take a look at covenants uh, that the Lord has made. We're going to take a look at, again, more pivotal moments that lead to the cross. And I hope that you will come back for next week's study, I hope that you will share this study with someone somewhere as well and that they will, too, come in and join us for, for the next few studies and that they'll go back and they'll check out all of the other studies that we have had this season. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following here on YouTube so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon, Sunday school lesson or a food for thought. Take a moment. Follow today.